Good morning, everyone. So thank you very much for your very kind words, Dr. Syed. Uh, thank you also to the organizers for inviting me to speak today. Thanks particularly to Glenda. She invites me every year, uh, and I'm glad we accept. Thanks also to the sponsors for supporting this uh, meeting. It's great to be in Liverpool. This is where I trained, and it's great to see people whom I've trained with before, like Richard. Um, today I'll be talking about cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa. Now, many of you may think that it's an unusual condition, and you may think why I have chosen this topic. But in the next 30 to 40 minutes, I'll try and explain to you why it may be a bit more common than we think it is, and it's a condition which we may be missing, because there's a lot I learned from the two case, cases that I currently have with this condition. I'll be starting with two case, report, case, uh, case reports. One of them came about in 2014, and this was seen by my colleague, Dr. Saudin. So when she presented, she had a three-year history of ulcers on the legs, but most interestingly, the primary lesion she mentioned was a red dot. So it started as a reddish erythematous lump. It would then increase in size. It would break down and form an ulcer. And she had repeated causes of antibiotics and none of them had any benefit. It used to keep recurring again and again. The swabs also did not show much change at all. <clears throat> now, when she came to see Joe, he was an incredibly astute clinician. So he noted two or three points which pointed towards the diagnosis of a possible vasculitis. The first thing he noted was the primary lesion. It was an erythematous papular nodule. The second thing he noticed was that there was libido around it, which means that the blood vessels under it were affected. And the third thing is that it did not respond to antibiotics. So with all these three clinical findings, he made a diagnosis of a vasculitis. And this is, uh, these are pictures taken when she represented in 2017, when I was looking after her. But I suspect these are similar to what Joe saw in 2014. Now you can see, I'm sorry, you can see that there are some areas of erythema and crusting, two crusted plaques with a bit of erythema around it. And there was a further lesion near the knee as well. So all the investigations were performed, the usual investigations you would perform for a vasculitis. Full blood count was normal, autoantibody screen was negative. The doubles, the ANA was positive, but it became negative when she was seen for follow-up. The ENA was negative and the double-stranded DNA was negative, which is usually important in confirming a connective tissue disorder. And the complement and anchor were also negative. She had a few neurological symptoms, so to make sure that there was no vasculitis in the CNS, and a neurology opinion, and then a CT scan was performed, and this did not show any changes either. So Joe first gave her prednisolone, a very small dose, only 25 milligrams, and within three weeks, everything cleared completely. Uh, and I'll show you the pictures. And the problem was, each time she stopped the steroids, the condition would recur again. So he started on mycophenolate, started off with a lower dose and worked up to one gram twice a day, which seemed to maintain the condition. And that's what she was on for nearly two years. Excellent remission, nothing at all. And then for some reason, she didn't attend the dermatology department and she was therefore discharged. The GP naturally was not happy to continue with it, stopped it, and then she represented it. And that's when I saw her in 2017. Now, from 2017, we gave her a course of steroids. We started at 20. Within a week, it was significantly better. Then we made it 15. And now she's between 4 and 6 milligrams. So that's the dose which seems to control her condition. I'm not that keen on giving her MMF again. She's now nearly 80. And if 4 milligrams works for her, I'm quite happy for her to stay on it long term. And that's what we're doing with this particular patient. So these are the two pictures which were taken when she represented in 2017. And you can actually see the dates there. The, on the left, you can see it's the 25th of July. And then within three weeks, the 8th of August, 
with just 20 milligrams of prednisolone, you can see that it's completely healed. In fact, there are just those two very small scars there. So you can see it's incredibly sensitive to oral prednisolone. The second patient was somebody whom I saw, I think about um, three years ago. It's all now pre or post pandemic, isn't it? So I saw her pre pandemic and she had this rash for quite a long time. It's about 20 months. Um, a very lividoid rash, very extensive, probably the most extensive livido I've seen. Started off in the ankles and then spread off the, uh, the shins and the thighs as well. And it always used to fade. So in the evenings it would be more prominent and in the mornings it would fade. And a GP had tried a variety of topical steroids but nothing worked at all. And as I mentioned, <clears throat> it's probably one of the most extensive lividos I'd seen. And it was extending upwards, it was going more towards the thighs. And when I saw her, she also had a, a few lesions on the left forearm. I always palpate these lesions and there was no nodules. I couldn't feel anything which was raised. It was all completely macular and blanchable. And that's the lividoid erythema. You can see it's very, very extensive and it's going on to the, the thighs as well. Also going all the way down to the ankles. Now, one important differentiating feature from this case, from the previous case, is there are no veins here at all. The previous patient, you could see there were quite a lot of varicose veins. There was venous flare. Here, she has absolutely no evidence of venous hypertension at all, which is an important point. And then there were a few areas in her forearm. Even those areas were completely flat. So again, all the investigations were done, full blood count, all the normal hematological, biochemical uh, investigations were normal, urinalysis were normal, inflammatory markers were normal. The P anchor was positive, but the anti-MPO and anti-PR3 were negative. And I think that's an important point. The rheumatologists often tell us that a P anchor by itself, if it is negative, the anti-MPO and anti-PR3, it's not that significant. And that's what it turned out for this patient too. Also, I was worried of two things. I was thinking there was either the blood vessels which were damaged, an immunological phenomenon, or perhaps something was occluding her blood vessels. Maybe there was some thrombus there. So those were two thinkings. Was it a hematological disorder or was it an immunological disorder? But all the parameters were normal. Anticardiolipin, anti uh, lupus anticoagulant, immunoglobulins, everything was negative. Now, when she came back for the biopsy, it was still quite flat, but near the knee, there was one area which was slightly raised. It just felt a bit nodular. So I thought, let me do a biopsy from that. And I took a quite a deep incisional biopsy from that. And very surprisingly, it showed fibrinoid necrosis. And we have a dermato dermatopathologist, S.M. Raweli, and he was dogmatic. He said, it's definitely polyarthritis nodosa. Now, this to me, it was very concerning. I hadn't heard about cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa. I thought it was systemic polyarthritis nodosa. So I sent her for rheumatology. Um, they looked at her. They said there were no inflammatory markers. All the joints were fine. There was some exertional dyspnea when she went to see them. So they referred her to cardiology to make sure there was no coronary artery vasculitis. A CT angiography was normal. I also sent her to nephrology. And they said that there were no vascular changes and the CT renal angiography was normal as well. Again, worryingly and concerningly, she developed paresthesia in the right wrist area. The rheumatologist sent her for nerve conduction studies, but there was no entrapment. So all they said was there was possibly a mononeuritis. Um, and they said there were focal inflammatory changes below the cubital fossa. Now again, here it was difficult because the rheumatologist did it but then they discharged her from the clinic. So I was forced to give her this diagnosis and the, uh, the uh, nerve conduction studies uh, results as well. So I took her to the grand round. We have a grand round every month in North Wales and I asked my colleagues what we should do. They, everybody said, yeah, it's got to be through the rheumatologist. We can't really deal with polyarthritis nodosa. Uh, but as I said, she was discharged. So I had to take on the mantle of treating her, um, they had suggested a short course of steroids. So from my previous case, I thought, let me give her a short course of steroids. I started at 20, came down by 5 milligrams every two weeks, but that did nothing. 
from my reading, colchicin seemed to be a drug which may be helpful. So I gave her four months of colchicin. That didn't work as well. In fact, it continued to worsen. And then I was more concerned. So I started giving her quite strong drugs. I gave her methotrexate, oral first for six months, 20 milligrams. Then I changed it to subcutaneous methotrexate. Again, absolutely no change. Then changed it to mycophenolate mofetil. It looked like it was stable initially, but then it started progressing recently again. And most recently, I started on pentoxifilin. So I'm getting more experience. I've read quite a bit about it, and I feel that it's most likely to be more benign. So I don't want to give her these toxic drugs. I brought it down to pentoxifilin, 400 milligrams, and that's what she's been on for the last few months. One of the uh, things about this condition is I find it very hard to to actually follow up these patients. I don't know what I'm looking for. All I'm looking for is the levido, and the levido hasn't really changed much at all. So monitoring these people for their response to treatment, I think, is quite difficult. And that's the latest picture that I have of her. The one on the left is at baseline, and the one on the right is the most recent. I mean, if you look at it very um, optimistically, you could say that perhaps something near the ankle is better um, but actually, I don't think there's a great change. In fact, if you look at the, the the thighs, it actually seems to be getting worse. Um, so more recently, I've been just reassuring the patient and telling, listen, I don't think it's going to harm you. I think we're just going to have to keep it under control. And the softer the drug is, the better it is going to be for you in the long term. And she accepts it as well. And that's the forearms, and you can see that it's come on to her right forearm as well. So let's look at this condition, cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa, what it is, how we treat it, and what we need to expect of it. Polyarthritis nodosa, the classical variety, was actually the very first vasculitis to be described. It was described by Kusmal and Mayer in 1866. In fact, they first called it periarthritis nodosa, and it was invariably fatal. So we knew it was a very significant and severe disease. It was only in 1903 that Ferrari took biopsies and he found that there was transmural inflammation. And he said, let's call it polyarthritis nodosa, which means all the layers of the blood vessels are involved. Cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa is much later. It's only in 1931 that Lindbergh coined the term cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa. And that's what we'll be discussing today. So it's predominantly a cutaneous condition. One of the most important ways by which you differentiate it from systemic polyarthritis nodosa is there are no systemic features at all. There may be some extracutaneous findings, but they're usually limited to the place where the rash is. So if she gets uh, peripheral neuropathy in the area where she has the libido, that's perfectly acceptable. That's what you get with cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa. With systemic polyarthritis nodosa, you get multi-organ involvement. But here, you don't. And that's the most important distinguishing point between the two. It's also more common in females compared to more common in males in systemic polyarthritis nodosa. And it's more likely to come after the fifth decade. If you see a child with polyarthritis nodosa, it is most likely that they have the cutaneous rather than the systemic form because there are quite a few case series showing cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa in children. We don't know the exact etiology of the condition, but we think it's immune complex mediated. And that particular protein seems to be quite important. What happens is it seems to be the prothrombin, which binds to the endothelium. And then there's a cascade of inflammatory changes which activates the complement pathway, and that's what causes the inflammation. So if you see this particular protein complex, which you can measure with antiphospholipid antibodies, then it may be a pointer that it's cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa. It can sometimes be associated with infections as well. Usually it's a streptococcal infection. It's not that commonly associated with hepatitis B. So with systemic polyarthritis nodosa, we usually check the hepatitis B. With cutaneous, it's unlikely to be positive. The streptococcus is more likely, so you're better off doing ASO titers. 
So if your ASO teeters are slightly raised, then it could be post-streptococcal. And if you treat the AS, the streptococcal infection, you have a good chance that the cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa may subside. There is some association with inflammatory bowel disease, which I'll be discussing in the next slide. And it can be associated with minocycline. And there, again, there are specific criteria, which I'll discuss in a couple of slides. So with inflammatory bowel disease, about 6% of people with inflammatory bowel disease will get cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa. And that can come usually before you get the cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa, most likely. But sometimes it can come during or after the course of inflammatory bowel disease as well. And it's noted much more commonly in Crohn's disease than with ulcerative colitis. Now, these are the criteria to call it minocycline-induced cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa. The most important factor, you need to have at least six of these seven criteria. So the most important thing is the person should have been on minocycline for at least 12 months. You have a libido, reticularis, and subcutaneous nodules, which I'll be explaining to you are the clinical features of cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa. You can get an arthritis, myalgia, and neuropathy but only where the rash is, just as it was for, in, for my patient. There is no systemic organ involvement. You get a necrotizing vasculitis, and unlike other cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa, you can get a pianca. So if you get a pianca, think in terms of a drug-induced cause. And again, the last one is improvement when you withdraw the minocycline. So if you have these six of these seven criteria, you can call it minocycline-induced cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa. Let's go on to the clinical features of cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa. The most common is subcutaneous nodules, but you can get libido reticularis, ulcers, and a few other cutaneous manifestations. By far, the commonest features are in the legs. In some series, they say 100% will be in the legs. Most say more than 90%. On average, it's about 97%. And that's because of the venous hypertension. There's lots of pressure on the veins. So the immune complexes go down there, and that's where it causes the reaction. The upper limbs are involved in about a third, so about 30 to 35%. The trunk is more only in 8%. So it's quite rare to get truncal lesions of cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa. Subcutaneous nodules are the commonest finding that you will see. And just as I found with my patient, you're better off palpating the lesions. It's much better to feel it than to see it. Uh, they are always multiple red tender, usually about a centimeter in diameter. And sometimes you can get the libido reticularis with it. Sometimes it can be in a place which is different to the libido reticularis as well. I mean, this can easily be mistaken for erythema nodosum or a form of paniculitis, but this was cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa. So sometimes you need to have clinical pathological correlation. You may need to do a biopsy, and that's what will show you that this is cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa. Much commoner in children. So if you see a child with these, very, they are usually less than half a centimeter in children. So if you see these sort of erythematous or bluish papules and nodules on the legs in a child, you could be facing cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa. There's a very nice series which came nearly 20 years ago, all of pediatric patients of cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa. Next is the levido reticularis. It tends to be very extensive. So unlike normal levidos which come and go, this will be a lot more persistent. And it can either come before or after the nodules, and it can come in at site different as well, as I've mentioned. You can get this sort of burst pattern. So what you get is the nodule in the center, the subcutaneous nodule, and then the libido around it. So it looks like a starburst. Some people call it burst. Some people call it a starburst pattern. And that's usually an, around a subcutaneous nodule which is ulcerated. And that's the way subcutaneous nodules and libido would look in a person with cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa. This is a very interesting series of patients. And they looked at the histology of these patients, and they made a very nice clinical pathological correlation. So what they said is, if the vasculitis is a bit deeper, near the level of the fat, 
you're more likely to get a libido because a bigger area of the blood vessel is affected. If the vasculitis, however, is at the, letter of, at the level of the reticular dermis, it's much more superficial, so you will get a subcutaneous nodule. So depending on what you see, you roughly know which type of blood vessel is affected. So if it's deeper, bigger blood vessels, levido. If it's more superficial, smaller blood vessels, and therefore you get subcutaneous nodules. So that was an interesting point made in that series. Next is ulcers. It's not that common. It's less than 50%, but it can be quite persistent. And generally, when you get ulceration, you probably need to treat it a bit more vigorously. And as I mentioned, you can get that starburst pattern. You get that ulcer in the center, and then around it, you get this levido, and that's supposed to be a starburst pattern. And that's typically how an ulcerated nodule of cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa could look like. Because this person has darker skin, you can't see the levido pattern clearly. And that's something you should probably look for in skin of color. In skin of color, the libido will not be very clear. You will only see these brownish or grayish marks, and the pattern of libido is not very clear because the pigment prevents you from seeing the exact way of distribution of the vessels. This was also an interesting article because they gave one nice clinical hint. They said that bathing these ulcers in povidone iodine, which is what most surgeons do, actually worsens the ulcers because it's cytotoxic. So they say that when you see an ulcer with, which is possibly cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa, you're better off using saline and don't use iodine, which was a good point I picked up from that article. You can also get it in children where the ulceration can be quite severe. And if you look very carefully, it has also caused autoamputation of the digit. Now, that's something, again, which I've read a fair bit in the pediatric literature. So if you see a child with possible cutaneous polyarthritis, particularly widespread ulceration, you probably need to treat it quite um, aggressively because if they come to the digits, it can cause autoamputation. This is a 14-year-old child who had steroids for just four weeks with complete clearance of the rash and ulceration. So generally, with ulceration, there's a higher recurrence rate, and it can be associated with neuropathy. And as I mentioned, you may need more aggressive therapy. So this was one of the most recent articles. It's not come on uh, in print yet. It came on online, and this is in the American Academy of Dermatology Journal. And this was, again, a very nice case series which looked at children and adults with cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa. There are other clinical features as well. You can get atrophy blanche-like lesions, inflammatory plaques, digital infarcts, and blue toes, and we'll briefly look at each one of these clinical features. This is atrophy blanche. Atrophy blanche are these whitish scarred areas, which you usually get in the lower limbs. Now, most of the time you think, oh, that's venous hypertension. You know, they've got varicose veins, they've got a venous flare, and that's why they've got it. But when you see a punched out ulcer like that, and it heals with this atrophy blanche. One of the learning points for me, which I will show you in a series soon, is that you do have to consider cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa. In fact, this is the series which was giving me another very good learning point. So this is the series where they looked at 29 patients with atrophy blanche. This particular patient needed prednisolone and azathioprine. Now, when they looked at the biopsies of these 29 patients, they found that six of them, after repeated deep biopsies, actually had polyarthritis nodosa. So all they did was take atrophy blanche, biopsied it, and six of the 29 actually had polyarthritis nodosa. And they looked at this particular six patients. They were all women. They all had prolonged courses. In fact, the average duration was 18 years. And the reason it was missed is the first few biopsies were very superficial. And only if you do deep and repeated biopsies will you actually be able to pick it up. So the two learning points from this particular series is, one is, if you see atrophy blanche, which is not resolving, you do have to think about cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa. The second point they make is, unlike other atrophy blanche, 
these patients will not have venous hypertension. So if you look at their legs, they won't have varicose veins, they won't have venous flare. So if you see a person with atrophy blanche without venous hypertension, I think cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa comes into the differential diagnosis. So two very good learning points from that series. Inflammatory plaques on the trunk, as I said, are rare, and it can affect any part. I mean, it can come in the thigh, it can come in the arms, in the back, in the abdomen. And this was a case which showed how it evolves with time. It starts almost like a small plaque of granuloma annulare, but when you feel it, you will feel the subcutaneous nodules around it. It then became more crescentic, much more extensive, and after 18 months, you can see after treatment, it has gradually resolved. And this patient, too, required a couple of biopsies, deep biopsies, before they finally made a diagnosis of cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa. It can affect the digits. So if you get, you know, these very distended tips of the toes or fingers, if you get bluish toes, that can be quite serious. So this particular case report, they had to give cyclophosphamide. They gave IV methylprednisolone and cyclophosphamide because they can lose their digits. But once they gave that, it settled completely and there was no other sequelae after that. So hit it quickly if you think that the digits are being compromised. Particularly in children, which I said autoamputation is possible, I think you do need to give fairly good dose of steroids to switch it off. Again, blue toes, that's an, another important finding. So if you get libido with blue toes, you think about all the other conditions which will block off the blood vessels, the hematological conditions, but keep this in your differential diagnosis as well. Generally, they tend to have a poorer prognosis, and they are the ones who do better with the drugs which open up the blood vessels, which I'll be discussing later. This is the most recent, just came on, I think, a few months ago, and it can have pyoderma gangrenosum-like lesions, but this came on after a biopsy, and I'll show you the images with the pictures. So this was classical cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa confirmed on biopsy, and then the patient developed this on her upper limb. So they did a biopsy of that, and then within a few days, it became almost like PG, and the histology was again, a neutrophil infiltrate with the vasculitis. So this was polyarthritis nodosa, but it looked like PG, and it resolved finally with steroids. What are the extracutaneous findings? I told you that you can get a few. Constitutional symptoms like fever occur in about 25%. Neuropathy is probably the most common. Up to 50% of people will get it. But the most important point is it should be at the site of the rash. So if you get a neuropathy outside the rash, you have to be careful. My patient had it exactly where the rash was. You can get arthralgias, you can get an arthritis, but it's usually non-erosive. But there are one or two case reports of erosive arthropathy as well. Myalgia, again, is quite uncommon. Only about a third of people will get it. I'll talk a little bit about the neuropathy because that's the one which you can get. It's a peripheral neuropathy possibly because of a vasculitis affecting one of the nerves or mononeuritis type of picture. The symptoms are exactly what you would see with any neuropathy, you know, numbness, paresthesia, some painful digits. And the signs are that there's sensory disturbance and absent reflexes. But the most important point, as I said, is you have to have the rash where you get these symptoms and signs. If you don't have the rash, you have to be careful that you're not missing out a systemic form. So what's the diagnostic tests you can do? There are no laboratory tests which are going to confirm it. It's like Bechet's disease. Even with Bechet's, you can't do a laboratory test. It's clinical pathological correlation. And that's exactly the same with this. You can do a biopsy. You have to do it to get transmural inflammation. But nothing else will give you a confirmatory diagnosis. You can get mild anemia and leukocytosis. And some of the inflammatory markers may be raised. If there was a previous streptococcal infection, then ASO teeters may be raised as well. And as I said, if there's a drug-induced cause, then p anchor can be positive as well. That's important because p anchor is usually negative in systemic polyarthritis nodosa. So again, a useful clinical point or laboratory point distinguishing the two forms. 
this antibody seems to be important and that's something you can get with antiphospholipid antibodies. So you get the IgM form which you can get in about 60 to 70 percent of patients. There was a recent series however where they dismissed that so it's still a bit controversial. You can get the IgG form of the same antiphosphatidyl serine prothrombin complex but that's less common it's only about 30 percent. This is a new antibody they found, anti-lysosomal associated membrane protein, but it's only in 10 to 20 percent. So perhaps in the future, we will be able to measure these antibodies and then tell the patient, okay, you have cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa because these are the antibodies that are positive, but that's probably much further in the future. Histopathology is quite useful. In fact, it's very helpful. And that's an excellent article which tells you how the histology progresses. Initially, you get only neutrophils and incredibly intense infiltrate. Then you get the fibrinoid necrosis. It starts affecting the endothelium. We probably see it in stage two or stage three because sometimes by the time they come to us, they get already the fibroplastic proliferation and the neovascularization. And then finally, in the heel stages, this is probably what you would see in the atrophy blanche-like lesions you get intimal thickening. And that's probably the reason why the pathologist missed it before, because it's late stage that we're giving them the biopsies from. And what you're seeing at the star there is the lumen being occluded by the thrombus, and the blood vessel, you can see, is clearly infiltrated by neutrophils with edema, and that's fibrinoid necrosis. So you get a leukocytoclastic vasculitis, usually of the medium vessels, but as I said, with the subcutaneous nodules, it can be some of the smaller, nod smaller vessels in the reticular dermis. Direct immunofluorescence doesn't give us usually a very specific answer, so it's not reliable. How do we differentiate cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa from systemic polyarthritis nodosa? It looks like it's two different conditions. It's like having morphia and scleroderma. Okay, some cases may progress, but most of them remain localized. And that's what happens here. In fact, there's only two case reports ever reported, and it's all from one series where cutaneous went on to systemic polyarthritis. Almost never will it progress on to the systemic form. And that's what gave me more reassurance with my patients as I started reading more of the literature. The systemic inflammatory changes are also mild. That's why any, all the inflammatory markers will be low with cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa. No deaths at all with this condition. And as I said, in the future, we may be able to measure these very, very specific antibodies. These are the diagnostic criteria which last came out for cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa. It's usually a diagnosis of exclusion. So the first is the cutaneous markers I've told you, cutaneous, subcutaneous nodding, libido, and purpura and ulcers, then the histology, and then all these 10 are exclusions because all these 10 are features of systemic polyarthritis nodosa. So if you get any of these, you're going straight away to systemic polyarthritis nodosa. So as long as you get those two and exclude all this, which is usually the systemic form, then you know for sure that it's cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa. This is a very old paper, but actually they made a very good job of differentiating the two. You can see that the blood pressure is usually normal. They've put here that the equal incidence, but actually it's more females in the last 20 years, that's what we found. There's normal inflammatory markers, all the blood tests are normal, no visceral involvement, and if you get any changes, it's localized to the areas where you have the skin condition. Using all this information, how are we gonna treat it? The most important thing I've found is we probably need to be conservative. So it's a bit tricky because when you look at the histology, you'll see polyarthritis nodosa and it really concerns us. But when you look at it clinically, you have a completely benign disease. So My fear initially was that it would go on to systemic, which is why I started my patient with fairly strong drugs, methotrexate and mycophenolate, which on reflection, probably I should not have done. Now that I've read, I would probably avoid overzealous treatment. I'd probably start off with something a lot milder, and I'll, we'll explain to you what the possible options are. 
what, what we are better off doing is just controlling the exacerbations. Usually the exacerbation lasts just a few weeks. So give them a short course of steroids just to cover them over. Give them pain relief. And if there is indication that a streptococcal infection triggered it, maybe a course of antibiotics. Sometimes they even give doxycycline for four to six weeks. Prednisolone is probably the drug of choice. You can give quite low doses. 20 to 30 milligrams is usually sufficient. But if you get ulcerated lesions, you've got to treat it a lot more aggressively. If you get digital lesions, again, a much higher dose. In fact, they suggest 60 to 80 milligrams if you have those features. The most important thing is to try and stop as quickly as possible when the symptoms resolve. And you can get intermittent courses as well. But some of them may require long-term low-dose steroids. And that's what I've found with some of my patients. I'd rather just give them, you know, four to ten millig five to ten milligrams of steroids than consider using those very strong cytotoxic drugs. NSAIDs also seem to be effective, indomethacin and aspirin. And this you can use when there's a lot of pain involved or when you think steroids are contraindicated. With these two factors, NSAIDs seem to play a good role. This was a case report of a child who had topical steroids with good remission. Only NSAIDs and topical steroids. You can see the, ch the child had cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa biopsied from the thigh and confirmed, and then came with this eyelash lesion. And the parents didn't want oral prednisolone. So they just gave topical alacon, mometazone, and that resulted in complete remission. So you can use topical steroids as well. The drugs which are used otherwise are colchicin. Dapson, some authors feel, is the first-line agent, but that's controversial. Some series say you don't have to use Dapson, you're better off using something different. But many authors feel that Dapson is a good choice to try if colchicin fails. Of the cytotoxics, methotrexate, azathioprine, and cyclophosphamide have been used, and the stronger agents are usually for the ones which are very, very ulcerated, or where do you have digital infarcts? There are case reports of biologics, etanercept, adalimumab, and rituximab, and there are one or two case reports of IVIG as well. But these are all, I think, will be more for patients where the digits are being compromised. This was a case series of methotrexate. The authors found it incredibly effective. So they noticed a response of, you can see, that looks almost like, you know, normal venous hypertension causing uh, atrophy blanche, but that was cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa. They used a dose of about 15 milligrams a week, and they noted very quick response. Within four to six weeks, they were clear. And then once you stop it, it remained clear for quite a long period of time. So this was a useful series where they feel that methotrexate is a very good option for cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa. I told you that the circulatory problem also needs to be addressed, particularly if you have blue toes, or digital infarcts. So these are all the circulatory condition uh, medications, anticoagulants, thrombolytics, antiplatelets, and vasodilators. So let's look at a couple of these drugs uh, when you see that the libido is associated with vascular issues. The commonly used ones are pentoxifilin, clavidogrel, and warfarin. So I'm going to show you a couple of case reports. So this was a 14-year-old child who developed cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa, biopsy proven. They used oral prednisolone, quite high doses, 50 milligrams, it settled, but each time the steroid was stopped, it came back again, and this was only a 14-year-old child. So they then changed to pentoxifilin, 400 milligrams three times a day, along with topical steroids, with very, very good remission. So within two months, there was settling, and it was remained clear at four months. So they've now brought down the pentoxifilin to 400 milligrams twice a day, and that's what they're maintaining it with. So some distal lesions may respond to pentoxifilin. This was a series where warfarin was used. What they did was they looked for an INR of 3. So if you have an INR of 3, it increases the flow of the blood vessels. So the immune complexes that are sort of uh, compromising these blood vessels are being sort of allowed to flow more easily. And all these are, these are cases where warfarin was used successfully. You can see that there is inflammation and erosions there, complete clearance after three months of using warfarin at INR3. Again, a lividoid pattern there, completely cleared when using warfarin. So one of the points they mention in the series is you 
you shouldn't use warfarin if they are asymptomatic. So patients like mine, where they have no symptoms at all, best not to use warfarin. If their digits are being compromised or they're having significant ulceration and symptoms, then you can consider warfarin. What is the course? So basically, it seems to be something which has a very, very chronic course. You, just like any other inflammatory disorder, it comes and goes, there are fluctuations, there are remissions and exacerbations, and the flares typically last short periods, four to eight weeks. So when you get these digital infarcts, if you just use a short course of PRED or something, you just switch over that four to eight weeks, you're probably gonna be okay. The children, auto amputation is common. So I think with children, if you do suspect cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa and there's inflammation, particularly in the digits, I, I would personally feel that we have to treat it more aggressively. But overall, a very, very favorable prognosis. It does not extend, it does not kill you, and it's more the cosmetic uh, reason why we actually treat our patients. There are some prognostic features which tell you that things may not be okay. So if you have more than two ulcers at the start, that tells you that there is more activity of the condition. If there is a raised neutrophil count, that's important as well. And some people have done a ratio of neutrophils to lymphocyte. So if there's a very high neutrophil rate compared to lymphocytes, they feel that's a risk factor. And also inflammatory skin markers. If there's increased CRP, that's a useful sign to tell you that the prognosis is going to be poor. That came out in that series in JAMA Dermatology. And when can it not be cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa? So if you have these, we have to be careful. So if you get repeated ulcerations or gangrene, if there's marked peripheral neuropathy, particularly if it's away from the site of erythema, if you get a positive autoantibody profile, that may be a connective tissue disorder which is evolving. If you have raised inflammatory markers or if you have a raised leukocyte count which is persistent, those are the signs that it may not be cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa. So when I looked at this topic, there were lots of concerns that I had about this condition. But from my reading, what I can gather that it's a completely benign disease. It may sound very horrifying when you look at that polyarteritis nodosa, but if you put a cutaneous before that, it's a completely different entity. You can have systemic features, the neuropathy which my patient had really concerned me, but as I said, if it's in the area of erythema, that's okay. This is possibly one of the most important learning points I've made, which is if I see a person with atrophy blanche and there's no venous hypertension, I may actually biopsy those areas because it could be cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa. And most importantly, I'm probably going to manage it quite conservatively. I don't think I'll push it too much unless there's ulceration or if the digits are compromised. I hope it's useful for you. Thank you very much. That was just amazing, honestly. Mm, thank thank you. you very much. I've always learned so much from you. Right, any questions? Because I think I made a list of about five. <laughs> <laughs> any questions? Oh, come on. What are, what are the differentials? You mentioned erythema nodosum. Are there other differentials for this condition? Yes, very good question. I think almost any other vasculitis can look like this. So histologically and clinically, we need to make that correlation because a lupus vasculitis could have similar features, but you don't get this lividoid pattern and you don't get these subcutaneous nodules. So it is going to be most likely an immune complex which is causing the vasculitis. So all the reasons for a cutaneous vasculitis will need to be excluded. I think it is a diagnosis of exclusion in the end because everything is negative and then you can make this diagnosis. Any As I was making my list, mm -hmm. and as you were going through your lecture, you were answering all my questions. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I would like to ask a few. So the 14-year-old that you showed us mm -hmm. um, with uh, your polyarthritis nodosa, I thought, gosh, that looks like pyodermaglinosum. Mm -hmm. But I suppose the, um, 
diagnosis is made on biopsy between those two conditions? It is. You, you do need to see a systemic leukocytoclastic vasculitis. And also the evolution of the condition, pyoderma gangrenosum would evolve differently. You won't get the lividoid pattern. And in that particular case, that was actually a case report from India. The thing is, it completely switched off once you had that. And that autoamputation is what gave the authors the, uh, the clue that they were dealing with cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa. So there are some subtle clues which you may not see with other conditions like pyoderma gangrenosum which may give you the diagnosis. The treatment is pretty similar, isn't it? It is very similar, yes. The only thing is that the course is slightly different. Pyoderma gangrenosum tends to be a bit more persistent, more painful with that crib reform scarring, whilst this is usually a fairly quick issue if it is cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa. Okay. Any questions before I go on to my next? Hmm. Okay, so do you involve the hematologists uh, when you see digital involvement because you mentioned about warfarin and the anticoagulation but do you involve the does it is it like an MDT type of condition or do you just go ahead and treat yourself? Yes that's very interesting I mean I personally haven't seen a patient who had has had digital involvement or blue or or red toes I think the rheumatologists are always going to be the first port of call because they may use something like iloprost which dilates the blood vessels. But if you are considering a hematological reason for this, which we need to exclude, then a hematologist would be a very important person to consider. As you said, it's probably MDT. I don't think we can manage many of these cases on our own if they become severe. We need our rheumatology colleagues and possibly hematology as well. Okay, and in children, how early does this present? I don't have the age of the youngest person, but most of them seem to be between 8 to 15. That was the uh, case reports which I've seen. There was one case report in the American Academy in 2003. I don't remember the youngest patient, but they're usually, you know, pre-teen or early teen. That's the impression I got from the case reports. That's very reassuring because mm. I see lots of vascular things mm. in my practice. And I thought, oh my gosh, how many PNs have I missed? Yeah. <laughs> Should I be lasering all this? I must be very careful. Um, libido reticularis um, in children is very common. Mm -hmm. You know, starting from physiological CMTC, mm. which is Ramalata, to um, much more very extensive CMTC. Do you think we should be considering PAN in this group of patients? It's, um, I mean, as you said, it's physiological. So most of them seem to occur in much earlier age groups, isn't it? It's usually between, you know, zero to five that you see that most often. My feeling is that clinical palpation will give us a clue. So if there are no subcutaneous nodules, no systemic features like neuropathy, I don't think I will investigate a child without a reason. Um, so if there are no subcutaneous nodules and it's sort of fading and coming, fading and coming, I'd probably just monitor them. So the next question, uh, question following that is how early do the nodules present in PAN? For children, it seems to be fairly early because that seems to be actually the most common presentation in children. More than the levido, it's the subcutaneous nodules which come first. So my feeling is that's the predominant lesion that we should examine for if you're suspecting cutaneous polyarthritis nodosa in a child. 